are recording. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, hello, my name is Tim Gritton. I'm the executive director of the library at Texas A&M University in San Antonio. Um, uh, thank you for coming to our conversation on practical management and practical magic. Um, and it's about the hiring process from both ends. So people who are looking to become a manager and also managers who are looking how, thinking about better ways to find the right talent for their pool. Um, I, just to give you a little bit of background for myself, I have, I have probably, I've worked at, at five different academic libraries. I have been a finalist uh, a little under 20 times. I've been on a search committee probably 15 times, so I've had a lot of experience. And you can say that can be good and that can be bad. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So that's, that's sort of briefly my, my background. And then my co-presenter today is... Trying to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, can y'all see me? I can see you. Okay, I just see Tim. So, um, so my name's Heather Lowe. I'm the Adult Services Administrator here at the Dallas Public Library. Um, I have worked in just about every type of library, um, been on tons of search committees. Um, we, when I got here at Dallas Public, we were very short-staffed. Um, I gave the example to Tim and Mary yesterday that when I started, I had two uh, departments and they there were five people and now those are separate departments and there's 22 people across the two of them. Um, so we did a lot of hiring really quickly and we've really um, been careful to think about how we hire folks here at Dallas Public. Cool. Um, so why don't you go ahead and share the screen if you don't mind. And then as she's doing that, I'll let you know that um, Niama Reed is monitoring the chat. So if you've got questions throughout, um, please feel free just to shoot a note to everyone. Um, so there can be conversations going on in the chat window. She'll be monitoring and then she will, uh, neither Heather nor I will be monitoring the chat during the actual presentation. So she'll throw up any questions um, at the very end that uh, would be helpful with it, to have a, would benefit from a broader conversation. But please feel free to chat to everyone uh, throughout, the, throughout the presentation. Um, and then we also have uh, a Twitter feed going, um, which I believe is hashtag llama chat. chat. Um, and Ginger Williams is, is monitoring that. So with that, I am going to stop the video of me so that you can actually look at the screen. And um, then if I can get control over Heather's screen, that usually takes a second. There we go. Okay, so first want to talk about the job search. So this, the first half of the presentation is going to be about people who is going to be hopefully helping people who are looking for a managerial position. So not a first time job, but a managerial position. And they're, so starting out is looking for positions. And if, you, if you're not really sure where to start or what your, what your fit would be or you know, what, what the possible opportunities could be, one thing you could do is to send your CV to a major search firm. And you could follow it up with a phone call to a partner, an associate. And the introduction doesn't have to be complicated. You can simply offer a variation of, I'm happy here at my school, whatever the name of your school is. However, I want to get a sense of where I am in terms of my potential and what, and what possibilities might be out there for me. And they'll hopefully sketch out the market situation. They'll talk a little bit about your strengths and weaknesses. And you'll get a, and, and I've had some really good recruiters tell me, you know what, if you're looking for this type of job, you, you really need to beef up this part of your, your CV and do a little bit more in this area of your, of your work. Um, internal versus external. If, if one of the things about professional development is talking to your, your boss. And um, if you, if you're comfortable talking to your boss, hopefully they're help, they want to help you grow your career. And that could be um, looking for a, a managerial position within your current library or a managerial position somewhere else. And you want to have those honest conversations with your boss. And, and I know not all bosses are, are that open to conversations. But if possible, 
you know, can you, can you talk to your boss and say, Hey, this is what I would like to do. Um, do you think there's a possibility for me? Where would you advise me to, um, expand my uh, skill set and develop some experiences in new areas. So talk to your boss, allow them to help you. And the last thing is to get on lots and lots and lots of listservs. One of the things that I sometimes recommend to people is find a PD, a job posting of a position that you want and look yourself and be honest, what is what is preventing you from applying to that position? What requirements, what even preferences that they have in the job announcement have you not had a chance to experience? And see if you can try to pursue those. Now, in terms of the application, you, you really want to think, about, you want to tell a story is what you really want to do. Um, don't just tell me as the, on the search committee, don't tell me that you've done all these experiences and just state matter of fact, I've done the experiences you asked for. Because a lot of people are doing that and it's, it's, it's boring and it doesn't allow you to stand out. Tell me a story about yourself. Why are you unique? You know, to tie your experiences, your habits, your talents into the organization's mission. Why would you excel and why are you excited about the position? If I can see some excitement in the cover letter, um, not just, hey, I'm looking for a job, that immediately shoots up about over probably two thirds of the other candidates. Um, if you can show excitement and don't just say I'm excited and I'm passionate. You really have to allow that story to show, to demonstrate that you're excited. Don't worry about the magic phrase that some people are looking for, you know, hey, are they looking for this particular um, uh, requirement or this particular skill? You can't get, you can't guess everything. So just don't worry about it. And don't worry about the general qualifications that everyone is going to, everyone is going to assume to have, you know, hey, I've worked the reference desk or whatnot, or I've, I've cataloged books, depending on the job, job requirement. What makes you special? And I just want to jump in and add that, um, you know, Tim and I were talking and a cover letter can really wildly change um, what your application looks, looks like. Um, you know, I've had applications where after I look at the resume, I wasn't particularly interested in, but then I read the cover letter and it filled in gaps and it showed passion. And then I was really excited about those candidates. Th thank you, Heather. Yes, I mean, it's, it's amazing how many people overlook the power of a, of a cover letter, even though they're told, hey, the cover letter is important. It's what is said within the cover letter that is so important. Okay, um, Heather, if you can shoot to the next slide, because I'm that's about when we're gonna switch over really briefly. There we go. Okay, so the, let's do, talk about the first round of the interview, which can be a phone interview, but a lot of times is a Skype interview. And one of the things that you wanna do is, of course, test your computer if you've got a Skype, make sure it's working, test it out with someone else. But I wanna show you something really briefly. And Heather's gonna stop sharing this for a second. When you are interviewing with a search committee, so frequently people forget what's back here and they don't think, I mean, this is not a great background um, because it, it distracts from, from the search committee looking at me. What's the light in the room? Where should you be facing? Where should you be looking? Right now, I am looking at the screen. So if I saw the search committee on the other side of the Skype interview, I'm looking directly at them. Well, I am not making eye contact with you right now because I'm looking at my screen. Instead, if I'm looking, if I am just staring right at the webcam, it, search committees have told me and other people have told me it really makes a difference. It's like, wow, someone's making eye contact with them, even though you're not. And so things are happening below, I'm looking down again, things are happening below the screen that you can't really pay attention to. So every so often you have to look down, but it's so much better to stare right at that webcam. And also pay attention, you know, practicing. You don't want to get too close because that's kind of uh, creepy. So in your prep, just sort of think, where should I be in the window? And then stare right at the webcam. I'm going to stop this and I'll have um, Heather start up the uh, screen sharing again. Um, great. Thank you, Heather. Heather. And then I will do this. Um, Okay, so then other things to think about in terms of your uh, Skype interview. One thing that I do is as soon as we start, I take a screenshot of the committee. 
And that helps for down the road because I remember who's on the committee. I know what they look like. Um, do you know the names of the, the search committee, whether they told you that um, beforehand, whether you got a calendar invite and you figured out everyone else who's on the committee? Um, Find out what you can about the, about the individuals. And then that way that allows you to confidently connect with someone later on. And when you're able to respond to Amy about something that Amy said, people are like, wow, that's, you know, that's, that, 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 they immediately feel that sense of connection. Write down the questions from the committees. You know, when they ask you that very first question, why do you want that job? Write it down. Because the questions will tell you what's important to the committee. And then write down who responded to your own, your own questions, and then you can mention them by name uh, when you write your thank you. As Erica pointed out, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then finally, those questions, you know, writing those notes down allow you to prepare for the potential in-person interview. And that can be challenging to do while you're trying to answer your question. But again, it's those little extra things that can make a difference. And of course, you want to prepare for the common questions, um, you know, the, the why you, give me an example of a mistake or an error in judgment, um, your strengths, your weaknesses. I, I've seen most committees have gotten away from weaknesses. They're not asking that as much anymore. And that's, that's good that they're not doing that. But it's nice to have that in your back pocket. And the important thing about weaknesses is how do you adjust to that because we all have weaknesses. Um, so error in judgment is common. Uh, example of decision making, leadership style, leadership philosophy, that sort of thing. But if you can know your top three points backwards and forwards, especially, you know, why do you want this job? Know those top three points backwards and forwards. That's almost invariably the very first question. And if you can start off really strongly, the rest of the, it's going to give you some self-confidence and the rest of the interview will just feel that much easier for you. And the search committee will feel more connected to you. And then I'm not going to go over these questions, but always, always, always have questions for them. And these are just some examples of questions that I have used in the past. Um, don't, you know, you, you want to ask questions that show you are invested in the position, um, that you really have, have had some thought of what you're wanting to do. And then hopefully, you know, even beyond this, what do you need to know if you're going to be successful at this position? And reflect upon that. Leadership, you know, a big component of leadership is reflecting. So reflect upon what you think you need to know if you're going to be successful. Think about your current organization and some of the leadership problems that are happening in your current organization. What would you need to know to fix that in a, in a future library? And try to get to the next, there we go. Okay, oh, back one, there we go, thank you. Um, so finally, uh, no, the next, in-person interviews. You've been invited to, invited to campus, that's great. Everyone is interviewing you. And I'll give you a specific example. Student tour guide, not even a library student, student tour guide was giving a campus interview. And they shared that one candidate was on his phone the entire time. This is for director's position. Was on his phone the entire time. And so didn't really pay attention to the, the student. Another candidate actually asked the student tour guide to wrap it up because he had other things to do. That got back to the committee. You know, you, you'd think that, you know, what difference does this make? This is just a, a sophomore on campus who's taking me around to buildings that I'm never gonna remember. You are being interviewed by everyone. You are always on stage. I talk about confidence because if you don't have confidence in, in what you're trying to do, people aren't going to want to follow you. And that's what leadership is, is you know, setting a, setting a pennant, out, pennant on the ground and saying, hey, this is the direction I think we should go. And if you're, if you don't, if you think, if you're not sure that that's the right way to go, people are like, eh, I don't know that's the right way to go. Um, so Project confidence when you can, of course. And then take personal notes. Take personal notes of your meetings. That helps you later on both with thank you notes. Also, if you get the job, it's something to tie back into. Oh, I remember when Brandon told me this. Um, and that can be really beneficial. Notes are also really useful for just slowing yourself down a little bit. I think a common thing that happens when you're being interviewed is you really speed up and you know you jump to answer something and taking notes taking a breath gives you a chance to think about the question before you respond 
That's a great point, Heather. And I, you know, I, I, you forget about it. You've, you, you have prepared so much. You have your 25 answers sort of down. You know, you've been, you've been practicing and rehearsing and you interrupt people's questions because you know what they're going to say. And by writing down the question, it's like, oh, no, you were asking something else. And you're also not interrupting. So that's, that's a great, great point. So when it comes time to the presentation, um, academic libraries almost always will have a presentation for the leader candidate. You're, again, wanting to tell a story. Tell a story about who you are. Again, tie it to the position, tie it to the organization, tie it to the mission. One thing that I've done to great success is I've tweaked the presentation based upon earlier conversations in the interview. So I might have heard something from Rebecca just wandering around the halls or she's on the search committee and interviewed me earlier. And I could say, you know, Rebecca told me this and I thought that was really interesting. Or a question that came up in one of my earlier meetings was this, and this is how I would address it. And so being able to show that you can respond on the fly, even within your presentation, just tweaking it a tiny bit uh, can win you a lot of points. And you should a pres oh, sorry, Tim. No, I was just saying a presentation seems like it might be something that only happens in academic libraries, but if you're looking for a leadership role of any kind, you're probably going to be asked to do a presentation even in public libraries. You should, thank you, Heather. And you should, you should expect tech failures. Um, so one of the things I do is when I've got my presentation, I save it on a USB drive, I save it on the cloud, I'll email it to myself. Um, paper notes and memorization is useful, but you don't want to be staring at your notes. Um, there's the old cliche about death by PowerPoint and, and reading the slides does lose you points. But one of the things I want to emphasize is you want to make eye contact with individuals, not the audience. As speakers, one of the, one of the things that we tend to do when, we, when you've got a large audience of more than 10 people, you tend, your eyes tend to gloss over the entire room. Your head moves back and forth, but you're not really connecting with anybody. If you connect with individuals as you were speaking, make eye contact, make them make eye contact with you and move on to the next person and keep talking. Again, you are starting to demonstrate how you will fit in with the organization, not just as an outside presenter, but someone who really belongs in this culture. And then in terms of, of, uh, back one slide, um, Heather, if you don't mind. Um, I, you know, I mentioned that I've been a finalist 15, 20 times, whatever it is. And, um, you know, I've only gotten five jobs. Sometimes I've rejected. I, there was a better candidate. Sometimes it just might not be about you. There are internal candidates. Um, there are situations when I've been on a search committee and, and just as a member and you kind of recognize for that the library wants to promote from within and there's an internal candidate. And as long as they don't fall down drunk on the day of the interview, they're probably going to get the job. So if you get rejected, don't, it's, it's not the end of the world. It's what did you learn from the day? Could you have done something better with your, uh, with a response to a question? That's okay. Um, it could be an organizational culture fit. Um, and Heather's got a really good, I'll let Heather jump, go ahead and jump in on your story. <laughs> so I was interviewing for an archive position. I was in a final interview for, um, an archive and foundation of a military figure that shall go unnamed. And the interviews went great. Like I was getting along with the interviewers, but when they, uh, emailed me to tell me that they were, wouldn't be offering me the position, they said, well, we just thought someone as artsy as you might go a little mad with all the military people here. Um, <laughs> so clearly that was about, you know, they didn't think that I couldn't do the job. They just thought I might, I'm, I might suffer, um, from not fitting into the culture there. And, and not all, uh, I, I, to be honest, I've had very few um, rejection uh, notices that were that open. Um, we, we're such a litigious society that people are very clinical about um, we've gone a different direction. But those sorts of stories happen. And then um, sometimes there can be changes in administration or funding and failed searches. 
I, there was a situation I was applying for a position and uh, less than a week after I applied, which I thought was a great interview. I thought it went really well. Um, I made a really good connection. The provost stepped down less than a week later and that threw everything into a, <laughs> you know, that, oh, well, I guess that's not going to happen. Um, so there could be difference of opinions between higher uh, between higher administrators, uh, higher level, uh, uh, level administrators about where they want the direction of the library to go, and so they choose not to, to pick anybody. Um, so sometimes it's it's not it just might not be about you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Heather to lead the conversation on looking for the right candidate. All right. Um, so looking for the right candidate. Um, I am a huge proponent of putting a lot of time into the search process. Um, to me, it's better to have a failed search that you have to do over again than to hire someone that you know, can't do the job or has personality issues because that's gonna do a lot of damage um, to your organization. So first you wanna really think about what, what you're looking for in this position. Um, you know, even if you're hiring for the same, same position, say you have a children's librarian that left and you're rehiring um, for that same position, think about, you know, just give yourself some time to think about what the core responsibilities are, what is that person going to have to do like day one, week one, um, and write those things out so that you have um, a really clear guideline of skills that you're looking for, um, responsibilities, what kind of traits is a person going to have to uh, be able to have success with those responsibilities and duties. Um, when you are looking at a job description, um, you know, think about what are must-haves versus nice to have. Um, you know, if you're hiring a cataloger, I would say attention to detail is an absolute must. Knowledge of, um, I'm clearly not a cataloger, but knowledge of, um, you know, RDA and those kinds of things are an absolute must. But it might be nice to have someone who um, can also explain those things well to new staff. Um, but you might not be testing for, say, working on the public floor. Um, and and I want to I want to add one thing in there in terms of the must have versus nice to have on the academic side. I try to have very few must haves because I want to because HRs in uh, academic libraries tend to be outside the library. And if you have a lot of must haves, then you see very few candidates. And the joke is I'm not looking for a purple unicorn. I'm looking, for the, I'm looking for the best cataloger or the best scholarly, uh, scholarly communications librarian or whatever that I can find. So don't create such a unique situation that you can't find anybody. Well, and, and keep in mind that you might find someone and maybe they don't match your list, but they're just such a good fit. They're really excited. Um, so all of these are, you know, kind of guidelines. Exactly. Um, and then I would really try to boil all this down and refine to, to the key traits that you want. You can have one sentence about the person you're looking for in your head. You can really use this as something to go back to. Um, you know, we just hired a brand new position, which I think is particularly tough um, here at Dallas Public. And so we had to do a lot of this thinking, a lot of building out um, what kind of person we wanted without really knowing what the core, um, what the immediate duties would really be or what programs would happen in the future. Um, but I wouldn't, I would never st skip the step of taking it slow, really think about what you're looking for and what, what you value. Um, to me, just going back to those must haves versus nice to have, we are pretty much always hiring for attitude. Um, here at Dallas Public. We can teach you a lot of things, but, you know, we're really looking for a, 
a heart of service, you know, an interest in community. Um, those are things that get us excited about candidates. Um, and then once you, once you have the job description and posting, really think about who will be part of the search committee. Um, number one, know the rules. Uh, whether you're an academic institution or public institution, there are almost certainly rules about how um, candidate searches go. Um, for example, you know, we are city employees, so we have to go through a training before we um, can interview anyone. Uh, there's rules about what types of positions can interview are required to be on search committees. Um, so just make sure that you know what the rules are. And if you're in a place that doesn't really have rules, you might uh, set out to kind of set some for yourself. Also make sure that your panel um, is really diverse. And of course that includes like ethnically diverse, uh, racially diverse, uh, but also you want to think about um, position diverse too. Like if you have a librarian who's, if you're interviewing for a librarian, you might want a manager, um, other librarians, and maybe a library associate because that person will be interacting with all of those people, even though some, um, some might report to the librarian um, and the librarian might report to uh, the supervisor. A good example of that for me, we, when we were hiring our homeless engagement quarter, coordinator, I made sure that um, our first floor uh, circulation supervisor was on the panel because she's you know, on the front line, she knows what's going on in the library and she is kind of a no-nonsense person. Um, and I knew that she could immediately tell <laughs> whether someone would make it at the library or not. Um, and then remember, uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I think I think I linked <laughs> breadth of position and true diversity into the same thing. Um, Tim, do you have anything to add as far as no, committee? I'm I'm, uh, just in terms of the committee, very similar to what you were saying in terms of the diversity of the panel. One of the things we do in academic li libraries is we will um, either have somebody who does the job, like right now I'm hiring administrative, uh, I'm hiring an administrative coordinator, administrative assistant, and I've brought in one of the VPs, administrative assistants, to serve on the search committee. So similar to what you were saying. Um, we'll also sometimes reach out into the academic departments to ask someone to serve on a search committee, like a faculty member, if we're looking for a um, arts and uh, humanities librarian, we might ask a professor in history to serve on the search committee. Um, who is this person gonna be serving? So that's, you know, we, we tr sometimes we'll go out into the community depending on the position. Um, right. Again, what are we trying to do? And often, uh, especially for upper level administrative roles in public libraries, um, they may ask someone from a peer organization uh, to just give a more neutral um, take on the candidates. Um, make sure that you think about how, what your process is and um, be very conscious of bias at every step of the process. You know, you wanna have a structure to your hiring process, I would suggest having, you know, a rubric of things that you're looking for. Um, read your job description and look at it um, to see if you have really specifically gendered or cultural, culturally specific terms. Um, you might ask for work samples. Um, these often can separate someone who sounds great in an interview um, or someone who maybe didn't do so well in the interview, they're not used to interviewing, um, but they really have a really creative take on how to tackle problems. Uh, you might also go name blind for portions of the review process. Um, and just above all, just keep in your mind um, constantly that every part of <laughs> interviewing and selecting candidates um, has bias baked in and try to counteract that as much as you can. 
And, and I'll throw in that the bias can be a, a, a number of ways that you're not even thinking about. Um, it could be someone who has a shared world experience as you, you know, someone who's the same age, um, who knows the same pop culture, um, someone who has the same sense of humor. I don't want to hire a woman just because she likes the Simpsons. Um, oh, wow. She's got the great sense of humor. You know, she's, she's obviously going to be a good librarian. Uh, that's just, we all have these and that's, that circles back to the diversity of the search committee. The more diverse your search committee is, the more likely someone's going to say, yeah, the Simpsons are stupid. Uh, uh, that's not a, a winning, winning <laughs> reason to hire this person. Well, and I think if you think about how your library functions and how your public services um, interact with the community, people, people from the community, you know, they have their preferred library staff to work with and it's, so, you know, hiring someone that may not be like you, may not have your same sense of humor, um, will only benefit your organization. Um, so, planning for the interviews. Uh, like I said, you're going to be thinking, thinking about questions, thinking about skills this entire time, um, leading up to planning for the actual interview. Now, you're going to want to take those skills that you're looking for, those traits that you're looking for, and make sure that those are baked into the interview questions. You know, are you um, concerned about how a position might interact with undergraduate students? You know, put a question into the interview about, you know, that might test for that. Um, I'm sure Tim could give <laughs> good examples. Uh, for us, we're always um, testing for how people would react in a public library type setting. For example, you know, we'll, we'll have a question of something, it's more involved, but something along the lines of a gentleman is disheveled and talking to themselves, but otherwise not bothering anyone. You know, what would you do? And that can be really, really telling on people's attitude towards others. You know, if someone says, I would call the cops, <laughs> you know, that might not be someone we would hire. Um, and and I, I would, you know, follow up on, on Heather's work samples from earlier in the, the presentation and, and, and similar to this. Um, I love questions that are outside of the box. I, I want applicants to reflect rather than rehearse. Remember I talked to when we're looking for a job, you want to rehearse? Well, as a search committee, you want to make sure that they're not rehearsing. Um, so I, you know, in addition to tailoring the questions, the position of the organization, I want questions that are outside of the box. Um, I'll give you an example of one that I was chairing. I had um, a library clerk who was uh, a gamer who, who role played. And so I basically, we had a question that said, you meet this library clerk, um, on the search committee, you meet this person at a campus social event. For the purpose of this question, he's a professor of biology. Talk to him about this job in question. And I prepped the clerk beforehand. We talked about what the professor of biology would know. The, the library clerk was not a biologist. The library clerk was not a scientist. The library clerk was a gamer. The library clerk knew how to role play. And it was really interesting. The person who got the job was, did not answer this question well at all. And that was fine because it's just one of many questions. But there was one individual who was just bombing the interview. And then all of a sudden, when we got to this question, he just, it struck him. And we saw a different part of his personality that we had not seen before. And all of a sudden, he went from never would consider to, oh, he's a really good second choice. And if, if we wanted to go in this direction, we're going to go with him. But instead, we're gonna, our library has a philosophy of this, this is the service we want to provide, so we're going to go with this other person. Um, but it really allowed this individual to shine. I, I do A-B testing with some of my questions. I will, you know, you, you pose the same question to uh, two different people, one who's good at it, one who's not so good at, at the job. Um, I did this with student workers uh, all the time. And if, if both people answer the question the same way, it's a bad question. Throw it out. If you can't have questions that can distinguish between candidate A and candidate B, it's a waste of time. Another thing that I've done um, is I'll, I'll talk to the search committee chair and I'll say, throw a question at me. 
for a position that I know nothing about. Like there was a, someone was hiring a catalog or a metadata specialist. I said, throw a question at me. And me not having the last cataloging experience I had was taking a cataloging class 15 years ago or whatever. I was able to BS an answer that he said, yeah, that's a really good answer. And I said, that's why it's a bad question. If I can BS an answer with no experience, no really direct knowledge, and I would not be a good fit, you need to change the question. And when I talk about experiences, you know, experiences are important, you're, but you're really focused on the habits, the traits. What are they more likely to do? And it's similar to what Heather said. Um, I like to say, what do you call the person who graduated last in medical school? You call them doctor, just like everyone else. But do you want to see that person who graduated last in medical school? You, in, in your daily life, you see people who are bad at their jobs everywhere whether it's a restaurant or a retail outlet, a big box store, um, in, in your library itself, you see people who are bad at the job, but they're eminently qualified to get their own job because they've got the experiences. So what sort of questions are gonna tease out the individuals who you want in that job as opposed to someone who can just fill the seat? Absolutely, and I think as Tim mentioned earlier, that's why a lot of search committees are moving away from questions like, please tell me, you know, what your greatest weakness is. Because um, again, that doesn't really, you know, that's something they could have practiced. It might not have anything to do with the position. Um, another, another thing that will be revealing is a demonstration of skills. Um, now you want to be uh, careful about what you're asking a candidate to do. You know, you're not going, you probably should not ask, say, um, a library associate to do a half hour presentation on something because compared to the position, that's a lot of work to put in for, for that position. But if you're going to be um, part of an administrative team, you're gonna be an academic librarian, that might not be quite such a big ask. Um, but you wanna make sure that you're not, um, you're not burdening someone with a task that's just too much work. Um, and often, um, just like with the scenario questions, I have had candidates where, you know, maybe candidate A, I was really preferring after the interview, but candidate B really shown um, in the, you know, in a demonstration of skills. And so we went with candidate B. So you want to be transparent. <laughs> Um, in the interview as much as you can. Um, you know, in a public library, we often um, can't pay you what you're worth. <laughs> so we're very upfront and honest about what the sort of pay range actually is, um, regardless of what it might say on the position description. Um, you know, provide interview details. Is it going to be an all-day campus visit? Are they going to see um, you know, the Dean of Libraries and the Dean of Students and you meet with a student group. Um, is it going to be an interview with a panel or an interview with one person? Uh, give good details so that the person knows what to expect. And remember that the candidate is human <laughs> and build this in. Um, I'm sure anyone who has uh, gotten to a final round of interviews for an academic position can attest that campus flyouts are extremely grueling. Um, so build in breaks, um, allow people time to breathe. Um, remember that especially at entry level positions, people are gonna be really nervous in an interview. That's not always representative of how, they, how they'll do in the position. And then explain the hiring process and the position description. Make sure that people know what they were applying for. Um, often <laughs> I've had the experience of calling folks for an interview and after I explain the position description, you know, they say, oh, I, I didn't realize that was what I was applying to. You know, I, I don't think I'd be a good fit. Um, and be, again, be fair about asking for work examples. And, and I just want to add really briefly that uh, one thing I, we do in the academic libraries, uh, especially because pretty much if you're going to be a librarian, you're going to give a presentation. Um, I always make sure there's 15 minutes to prepare. Um, and I ask the candidate on that day, do they want company 
or do they want solitary time to prep? And, and I say, you know, no problem either way. Different people like different things. We're, you know, I'm, I'm not hiring the person to be a full-time um, interviewee. I want to give them the time and the opportunity to present themselves the best way they can and allow them to be thoughtful about their topic. So now we're getting to the actual questions part, which we've covered a little bit. Um, so when you're thinking about questions, uh, again, I would check with, um, if you have HR, um, you know, check with your HR department to make sure there aren't specific questions um, that you have to ask. We have, here at Dallas, we have, um, we have to get questions approved, but we always have to ask the same first question, which is generally, you know, how are you qualified for this position? And then we have to ask some type of ethics question, some type of diversity question, um, and some type of community service question. So we have to build those things in. Um, and I think that's, that's actually a great way to think about how you're developing your questions. Um, you know, what are, what are you looking for? So you want someone with some technical knowledge, someone with, you know, a can-do attitude. You know, go through that list of must-haves, uh, would like to have, and, and build your questions around those. As Tim said earlier, look for reflection um, versus practice responses. Um, and that can, that just means, you know, perhaps you're wanting to know um, about how someone will communicate in the workplace. You could obviously ask, you know, how would you communicate with your coworkers and the public? Um, but something more specific to ask might be, tell me about a time where you had a conflict due to a communication breakdown. You know, and this is, this is a complicated question because it requires candidates to think about, one, what is a communication breakdown? And when was that um, applicable in a conflict that I had and how did I resolve it? Um, ask questions um, that look for aligning values and goals. As I said earlier, we really hire for attitude and um, and commute. Yeah, for attitude, for being community service oriented. Um, so if that's what you're looking for, you know, make sure that you have questions that will reveal that um, from the candidate. Again, add scenario based questions. Um, I would say don't have all of your questions be scenario based because that can can be a bit tedious um, for the panel and for the candidate. Um, and then check for potential issues. Say you're hiring for a position that um, perhaps you had to let someone go from for a behavioral issue or ethical issue. Make sure that you're asking about that <laughs> in, um, in the future. You know, if you had, if someone was, I don't know, um, they were a teacher and they were uh, hanging out with students outside of work um, in a kind of inappropriate way, you might ask about boundaries um, between teachers and students. Any other things you have to say before we get into? No, considering the time, I think just go to the questions. All right. Um, so when we really only had two questions and then we'll go to the questions you've asked during the session um, So the first is for a public library. Would you have Skype interviews <laughs> as someone who got hired from Skype interviews at a public library? I would definitely say yes <laughs> um, But yes with a caveat uh, You don't want to cut yourself off from people who might be a fantastic fit who would be excited to move to your city um, just because they currently live in a geographically far away place. Um, so, you know, I think you should be open to having interviews with people who don't live in your city. Um, but be really thoughtful about how you do this. Um, you know, if you're holding in-person interviews for everyone who's in town and then a Skype interview for the one person who's out of town, that, you know, might create some bias it's a little bit harder to connect through Skype than it might be in person. 
So you, you know, you might consider if you have a couple of great candidates that um, can't come in for a one-on-one -on -one or an in-person interview, you know, maybe you, you do the first round all in Skype, even for local or internal candidates. Right. Okay, and the other question uh, came from an academic uh, librarian, and the question was, how can managers look out for potential personality issues with applicants? For example, say you've recently had personnel issues and now have a position open, how can supervisors, managers, directors, etc., suss out red flags more in the interpersonal vein rather than the skills ideas vein? And, and that's a great question. It's a really hard question. Heather's talked a little bit about this recently most recent couple last couple couple slides but um there it's this is such a huge issue there are so many personality <laughs> problems that are out there in the world um there's narcissism there's aggression there's rigidity in thought there's unethical behavior and you can't ask about all of them or you're not going to be able to have time to uh ask about <laughs> all you know are they going to be a good librarian um so think about what really you're concerned about you know don't just drill down and think you know really specifically what personality issues you're concerned about so for example um narcissism rigidity you can ask questions about empathy or flexibility um and one example of a question that i've used could you please describe an instance in your professional life where you were asked to solve a problem despite lacking all the facts um, please give us an example of how you have persuaded a group of skeptics that your course of action is the best strategy. Now, the expectation is that they haven't prepared for that. Um, if they're any good, they'll probably come up with an, a good answer, even if they've got some personality issues. But hopefully you'll be able to see through some of the red flags that come up in their answer, and you can follow up. On what on some things that they have said, everyone's going to put themselves in as best as light as possible. But then it goes down to the reference checks, and for this, because again, we're talking about uh, especially looking for someone who is seeking a leadership position. Um, it, are they an internal candidate? Do an honest 360 review. Try to make it as anonymous as possible. Ask for the people who they've worked with. Ask for people who they've supervised. You know, create an anonymous survey and ask for feedback. If you are, um, if somebody is an external candidate, what I recommend is what I call parallel reference checks. If you are a uh, cataloger, ask a cataloger at the, the other library where the person's coming from and ask, you know, what is this person like? If you're a head of reference, ask the head of reference. Hey, I'm the head of reference of this at Texas A&M University of San Antonio. What were they like at your at your university? Um, and it's it's hopefully you'll be able to get some information out of that. But that's one of the reasons why I'm I'm so focused on trying to come up with tough questions. That's gonna that's gonna kind of put them on the spot. Um, and I don't want them to skirt around with just some some really easy questions. I need to ask them things that I can I can truly find out who they are. And then we have just a just a couple of resources for you. Um, Tim has a great book um, about coping with toxic folks <laughs> in the workplace that might help you come up with some questions. Um, there's also the Harvard Business Review is a great resource um, for management um, guidelines, so finding and keeping the best people. And then there's a really lovely organization called the Management Center, and they have all kinds of tools um, for almost every aspect of management. Um, so you can look at that and it'll help you, um, you know, there's worksheets on thinking about position descriptions, um, interview questions, all of that kind of stuff. And we'll leave this up, but I think um, it's probably time for questions. We've got about uh, 11 minutes. So, Nayama, did anything come through? Did we lose Nayama? Maybe. Um, let me, like, I'll look through the... Uh, her mic isn't working. Okay. Um, all righty. So she's going to paste. That that works for me. 
I, one of the things we do, one of the things we didn't want to do is, as speakers, we didn't want to keep looking down. Okay, can you give me, uh, can you give examples of how to show excitement in a cover letter? Okay, um, let's see, because what you, Faith, go ahead, Heather, go ahead. I think connecting, like, like connecting who you are and like what you value with what the organization values. Um, to me, that's like telling me really why you want to work at this place doing this thing um, in a way that isn't just like, oh, I'm qualified, but you know, I have a personal connection to this issue. Let's, so a lot in academic libraries, um, most universities, student success is important. Um, it's somewhere in the top three, no matter what university it is. And so if in your cover letter, you're going to be talking about student success and how you have in the past helped students. And let me tell you a story about uh, a, a particular student that came into our library. And these were the challenges that student was facing. Um, you're not making stuff up, so I don't want to make things up, and I'm, I don't want to give away my cover letter. Um, but you're telling a story about something that impacted a student at your library, how you addressed the situation, and how the, the student walk, walked away feeling more successful. And that ties it back in to. Um, into the student success. And the way that you're writing that letter, it's not just a matter of fact. I mean, if, if, if this is something that's important to you and you truly want students to be successful, you're gonna find, and the student walked away and you could see that they were happier. And you know, uh, I'm being very simplistic because it's sort of a, a quick um, 20 second answer. But think of those stories and think about why it, it made you happy. Why did it give you warm fuzzies? and say that. Work examples were mentioned twice. What is it? A portfolio, particularly for academic positions. Okay, so for academic positions, um, I'll give you an example. For that metadata specialist, we actually gave them a book to catalog. It was not an easy book to catalog. We knew that there were gonna, it, we actually went looking for a book that was gonna have lots of challenges. Um, one that we did not expect 100% results. And as part of the, the day, uh, as part of the agenda, so the, the schedule that, that the candidate saw, we said, here's a half hour to review a book, to catalog a book. At the end of that time is when you're gonna have your meeting with the search committee. And one of the first questions we're gonna ask you as a search committee is, so what sort of problems did you have with the book? What was your thought process as you cataloged the book? And so we'll have a product, both in terms of what they cataloged, you know, sort of how, how they did it. And then we'll, we'll talk about their thought process um, in the search committee. So it, again, it's something they've just done. So if they're, if they're a decent cataloger, um, they may not have gotten it right. That's fine. How did they think through the process? That's what really is interesting. It's, in essence, it's that old high school, show us your work. Show us the math, you know, show us the steps you did to, to come to that solution. Um, and that's what we did for the show us this. Um, can you address the fact that public libraries do not pay candidates, this is for you, Heather. Can you address the fact that public libraries do not pay candidates to fly for interviews? I've spent a lot of money and time on two different interviews, thinking each time that this was the final stage of the hiring process and that I landed the job. Each time I received an automated email stating I wasn't chosen for the position. Um, well, it stinks. Um, <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> so, I mean, personally, I would probably not fly out on my own dime. Um, you know, I, I, I just think, like, unless you're independently wealthy and you're just looking for a job because you want something to do with your time, um, I, 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 I just I, I, really, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put your resources into that. Um, if it's important for them to have you come out, like they should be able to find a way to do it. Um, and 
And if not, you know, I, I know you don't want to say you get the job offer and you've never been there. You know, that's a very difficult decision. And, you know, at that point, if you want to go out, that might be a decision you have to make. But I, I really wouldn't invest my own money. And, and it, it stinks. I mean, that's especially when you're really desperate for a job. Um, it stinks. But think of it this way. They're, the library is selling themselves. I worked at a public library, a couple of public libraries before going the academic route. If the, li the library, in essence, is acting as a sales rep for a company, a sales rep for the library. And if they're not willing to invest in you when they're trying to make the sale, how much are they going to invest in you as an actual librarian? How are they going to treat you when you've got the job, if, you, if you're lucky to get the job? Are, they, are you just going to be scrapping for, you know, are you just going to be desperate for any scrap that you can find? Um, it's just, that would raise way too many warning flags for me as well. So I agree. Um, I may have, let's see, uh, okay, uh, next question. I'm a recent MLIS graduate. Any tips for someone wanting to go into management for the first time? What should I do if a school keeps changing the job description and title with each reposting, urban or suburban, academic or public? So I can tell you um, from the academic side, I've been in both urban and suburban settings. Um, what I suggest, and this, it's, I kind of mentioned this in um, looking for, job postings that are out there and um uh and, and and candace i see that how can you get hired in academic library without having a second master's degree most of us the job postings require this i do not have a second master's degree i am an executive director of the library i only have my master's of library science um so some director positions are now require require phds a lot of them are moving away from phds um, again, it's trying to expand the pool. Um, but going back to the, the, the question, so ha having that extra master's can help, um, but what are the requirements in that job? Um, I think there was, there was a posting of a, I'm not going to name it, but there was a university in, in Illinois, and they posted their position, their director position, like three or four times over the course of nine months. And, and they were requiring a second master's. Um, and they were not finding the candidates. And rather than looking at the requirements, they just reposted. Um, so if you're looking for position, what positions are out there right now, talk to your boss. It seems that I am missing, this is the next managerial position, I need to have managerial experience. I'd like to, I'd like to supervise a student. Just start with supervising a student and see what that's like. What, what would it entail? Um, you can't just say, I want to supervise a student just for the heck of it. There has to be a reason. There has to be a, this student would help me do this. Um, and so that's, again, part of leadership, part of management. You're having to justify why you want, why you want to get somebody. Um, okay, and, go ahead, Heather. Oh, I just wanted to jump in and say, like, this discussion – is relevant for people who are looking to hire candidates too. We recently took away the requirement for our library managers to have an MLIS um, because we had tons of library staff that would make awesome managers but didn't have that degree. And now we have, you know, almost all of our manager positions filled with great people. Okay, can you talk, we have two more questions, so we'll see if we can get through them in two minutes. Um, can you talk about how you approach crafting posting positions that might involve hiring from outside the industry? For example, a purchasing manager with history in the business industry rather than librarianship. Well, if you can make the case to the library, because sometimes you might get a lot of resistance from your own culture um, to that approach, but I think it's a, it's a perfectly valid one, just be upfront. And, you know, we are looking for, um, uh, the requirement is a bachelor's degree um, or the requirement is a bachelor's degree in finance um, or in science or in the industry or whatever. Um, library science degree, not necessary. I just be open. And it sounds like maybe you're, you're looking to hire um, someone who wouldn't necessarily play a traditional role in a library. Um, we have a homeless engagement coordinator. She's a social worker. She doesn't do case management, but I went through and looked at job descriptions and requirements for social workers um, across the city and, you know, asked people I knew who were social workers and libraries if I could see their job descriptions. So that might be an option too. 
And that's a good one. And then the last question, how can I make my resume stand out if I haven't worked in library for nearly 10 years? I saw a great example of this recently. You're up front. This is, this is what I've been doing for the last 10 years. I had health issues or I was family issues, half a sentence. This is why I've been out. But I so missed the library world. And this is what gets me through my day are doing these activities. I love it when I did this with the library director. I love it when I did this with the students. I loved it when I did this with the faculty or members of the public or whatever. And again, why do you wanna be a librarian after 10 years? If it's something that it really got you through the day as opposed to it's a job, tell me. And I'll, I'll sense that passion and I'll ignore 10 years um, if I can sense that again, you can bring something else to the table. Heather? Yeah, I actually had um, someone apply for a job who hadn't had any work experience in the last like seven years. Um, and they were like super frank in their cover letter and said, you know, I had a drug problem. I was in rehab. I wasn't able to work. But now, you know, like I've been in recovery for a few years and, you know, the library was a place I hung out. I'm very, you know, like that's a pretty extreme version of being out of work, but he was able to um, connect how he wanted to give back and help the community because they had done so much for him. Um, and, you know, that, that made me take definitely a second look at that candidate. Um, okay, so it's 12.01. Um, thank you very much. Uh, um, Heather, did you put a link to the survey at the I end? I did. Okay, so um, here's a link to the survey, and we'd love to get your feedback on, on this and other, quest uh, other questions that you might have, other future ide ideas for future presentations. Um, but with that, thank you so much for participating on a very cold day across <laughs> the United States. We really appreciate it and hope you got something out of today. Thanks. And Heather, could you give me um, a physical link that I can put in the chat box oh, to the survey? Uh, Tim, do you have? Uh, it came from Polly. Give me a second. Just a second. And I've got it. I am putting a comment to everyone. And here we go to everyone. Did that go through? There we go. Yep, just saw it. All right, so there's a survey in the com in the chat box. Thank you, Tim. Okay. And I think we're all set. So thank you very much for participating. I really appreciate it. Good, very good questions. And have you stopped recording, Mary? <laughs>